Well, good morning, everybody. Um, hi. <laughs> uh, welcome to this next session. Um, and uh, I, I just can't tell you how amazing it is that the first 10.30, every single session was full of people. You know, I was, do you remember, I don't know, some of you were here yesterday. Um, Shami Chakrabarti said, you're all mad. What are you doing getting out of your duvet so early? Uh, somebody shouted back, well, because you weren't in it. Um, <laughs> She'll never forget that moment. But, but anyway, the, the, um, the, the thing is, it's, it's, it's fantastic that there is such a, an appetite for coming together and joining in. And there's a lot more men today as well. I just want to say welcome to all the men in the audience because it's tremendously helpful. Uh, but the criminal justice system is something that I've been concerned about for a very long time. I mean, once you know the statistics for men and women, about what, what, who is in prison, why they're in prison, what prison is doing to them, et cetera, then you, know, you just can't help but think in 100 years' time, we'll look back on this and go, do you know what they used to do? They used to do this. Can you believe it? I'm sure that's where we will get to. But in the meantime, there is so much we need to think about and know about and do. And for women in particular, this, well, or, you know, the, the system provides kind of almost no opportunity for, for change and reclaiming personal identity and these are women who largely have had that stripped away from them long before they went into prison so it's a really powerful debate about what women uh, can do about the criminal justice system how much power they can have within it um, and and what would happen you know along with many other things if women did have a lot more power and fortunately and I'm very pleased that Lucy Gamble is going to chair this debate She's worked for 25 years in the voluntary sector. She's, you know, she, she has taken on all kinds of issues around activism. And then in 2009, she was appointed as the independent member of the parole board. Uh, she's the former director of Action for Prisoners' Families. And she was 15 years doing that. And she's recently been closely involved in the course and Independent Funders Coalition, which is the campaign against the imprisonment of women. And she co-edited The Children of Imprisoned Families, published in May 2011 by the Danish Institute of Human Rights. She's a trustee of Klink's, the National Foundation, and is vice president of the European Network for Children of Imprisoned Parents. We're in very good hands, and I'm very grateful to her. She'll introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Can you, is this working properly? We haven't done a sound test, so, um, okay, great, excellent. Well, it's a, it's a huge honor and a privilege to be here today to be chairing this, um, I think, really important session. Women are frequently overlooked across society, and I think arguably nowhere more so within the, the criminal justice system, where women make up just 5% of the prison population. But actually, when you look at the, the spe in England and Wales, that is, and when you look at the spectrum of the women that are in our system, they are, they are misrepresented. They are women who, by and large, have not committed violent, serious violent offences and are not a severe danger. Some of them are a danger to the public, but many are not. Many are more a danger to themselves with a huge history of uh, violence and abuse within the home, drug and alcohol abuse, which has often uh, come up as a result as their only way of trying to deal with the, the horrendous uh, experiences that they've had within their home. Um, and, you know, a vast the vast majority of them have got some kind of mental health disorder and what do we do? We lock them up in an institution which is a brutal environment where they can't be themselves, where they can't get the holistic treatment they need. Um, and I, you know, I think, uh, as Jude said, it, it's a scandal, and it's not just in England and world, in Wales. We're extremely honoured to have on, on my left Dr. Kiran Bedi from India here today, who has been a phenomenal force for change in, in India and is deeply respected, highly regarded for the work that she's done in uh, campaigning and seeking improvements uh, for, for not just for women in prison, but uh, for prisons in general in, in India. And she'll be telling you more about her incredible work uh, shortly and, and her experiences. Um, and then on my, my uh, immediate right, we have um, Sophie, who is, um, sorry, Sophie, I've, Barton Mills, <laughs> who um, is a former prisoner herself. She is a poet. She's a political activist. She advises now the prison service and government on women's imprisonment issues. And in 2009, while she was actually a serving prisoner, she co-curated the Kersler Prison Awards exhibition, which is hosted here at the South Bank Centre every year. If people here have never come to the Kersler exhibition and the amazing event 
events that Jude Kelly and her team now promote around it, I would urge you to come. It's every year in November. It lasts about three weeks. And it's a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, celebration of the talent of prisoners and, and offenders in this country. And um, Sophie co-curated the, the exhibition in, in 2009. And then on my far right, we have Rachel Hayford, who is the director of Women in Prison, which is uh, the, the, the sort of sole, really, campaign organisation in England, in the UK, campaigning specifically on the, the issues for women offenders. And I think um, what's clear throughout history, really, is that women have been a huge force for social change, and nowhere more so than, than in criminal justice. You just think of names like uh, Elizabeth Fry, you think of names from the human rights, Eleanor Rosenfeld, Rene Cassin. Women are a huge force for change, and so many of our, our activists today are, are great, powerful women, not just in this country, but around the world. So without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Betty, who can say a few words. I'm going to ask each panelist to speak a little bit from their own perspectives, and then we'll open it up to the floor, and I hope we'll get some really lively discussion going from all of you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Betty. Thank you. Uh, tr truly an honor being with you this morning. I'm, as she said, from India. I've been a serving police officer. I became the first woman in my country to join the elite officer ranks of the Indian Police Service. I happen to run a prison. Um, as police officers in India, we sometimes do get assigned to run a prison. I got that kind of assignment. It was one of the most notorious prison in Delhi, which I was assigned to. It's the largest in numbers in Asia Pacific. When I say that, it meant having 10,000 prisoners in one complex, of which 9,700 were women, men, and about three to 400 were women. It's a floating population. So that is how I got an experience of running the prison, both from inside and outside. So I could walk in and walk out, but I spent two good, strong years with prison management. But I made literally four years out of the two years because there was so much more to do in that prison. Uh, it was a hellhole of an institution. Reform was not a part of the manual at all. It was, it was a prison manual almost of pre-independence days. And reform was not an issue. There was no budget for education, um, uh, counseling, um, um, uh, rehabilitation, reintegration, etc. And the men had let it be. It was like a go-down where you could count. It was like a head-counting institution when I took over. Now, I knew what was wrong with the prison because as a police officer, whomever I had sent to the Delhi prison in that complex came back reoffending, ready to reoffend. So I was a victim of bad prison management as a police officer. I happened to get that same institution, and now it was my turn to turn it around. And I started to look at as an institution which is meant to reintegrate and stop reoffending. And what all I did, what all happened during those two years is now history. It's in fact a classic book. If any one of you really wishes to go in detail, just pick up this book. I have, this is the last book, a personal copy had already given away to a friend, but I fortunately get, uh, borrowed it for the, this morning to show you. This is probably available on the Amazon called It's Always Possible. I don't think I can rewrite it. I don't think I can redo it because so much has happened, uh, so much happened to be corrected that I myself amazed how micro and macro it became. But the key was, now since we focused on more on women prisoners, what I did see was that women were the most neglected, endangered species. Literally, they were, and they also had children with them because in Indian prisons, as in some prisons around the world are allowed, they were allowed children up to the age of five. And I know as a police officer, outside when women prisoners went in, they, they used to lose their children outside to, uh, to, un, to irresponsible fathers or parents, and they would be kidnapped or abducted, and they would go around after release from prison, go around looking for the children, and they never found them. So I had children to work with. I had these women who were like endangered species, exploited, corrupted, um, um, violent, uh, victims of violence, victim of misbehavior, victim of corruption. Even lawyers were, uh, were cheating them. All I did 
uh, as I documented was, I put a proper timetable for them, as I did for the men, I did for the women, and women obviously um, needed me more for an emotional connect, and they accepted me much more, because they thought I was them. I was one of them who would probably, who would understand them immediately. So I put them through a wonderful timetable of the day, brought yoga, brought meditation, brought education, brought counseling services, brought art and culture, ran a school for them inside the prison, brought banking to them so that they can bank, brought in all kinds of even little kitchen gardens for them, separated their kitchen from the main prison, and it became an ashram. The same prison, women which where they felt bottled up and angry, we converted it into an ashram where counseling, uh, festivity, music, uh, reflection, mindfulness, uh, visitors from outside, and the model which got created was, I would, which I put it in this book called the 3C model, called collective, corrective, community-based. It was collective because it, prisoners, women became a homogeneous society within, and they started to work on the 3C model. So this is detailed in the book, but I brought in a lot of community from outside as non-profit organizations, and for the first time allowed them to work. So all these, when I told you when I began that there was no budget for this, I created a no-cost budget. I created a no-cost model where NGOs from outside, from all faiths, from all backgrounds, once security cleared, were authorized to come in and provide the services of a development holistic prison management. The key to reform in my women prison pro program was time management. What you need to do in the morning, what you need to do in the night, what could be best done in the evening, how do you use your afternoon, and it was all about mental growth, holistic growth. And I can tell you that, that during the two years time where the reoffending was very high, before, before me, there was no reoffending so visibly, except for the poorest women who would come back to the prison for delivery of their pregnancy, because the medical was so easy for them. So this is the same thing happened with the children, started a playway school with the, for them, and then now it is time to do what do I do after the age of four, and that's the time when I became a foundation myself. 1994, while I was still the inspector general or the governor of this prison complex, I got received the Asian Nobel Peace Prize called the Raman Maxisi Award, which is part of prison reforms, became one of them. And I set up out of that award money a foundation called India Vision Foundation, which now took over these children from the age of four to start a school program for them after school. And that is how I have 200 children today in my foundation into mainstream schools. Some of them are in playways still because that's a new, new crop and some of them are graduation classes. That's one of the first and the largest model run by an NGO from within the prison uh, um, in India today. It's been covered <coughs> extensively, but it's a success story. And if you wish to see more about that, uh, we call that program called Children of Vulnerable Families. We mainstream them into school, they do normal schooling, we do PTAs, etc. And that's how the program, if you wish to know more, you can go to my website and see this program to, to, um, to see how and the nitty gritty of it. But it's, it's a great success. It's actually saved the next victim. The, the USP of my foundation is save the next victim. And that's exactly what this program did. By this, women are uh, being saved from being victims again by rehabilitation and by all these programs. And children being taken over also being saved for becoming the next victims. I'll answer more questions when you have the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Betty. I think you can see exactly what I mean about inspirational women, women who have a can-do, and as, as the title of Dr. Betty's book is called, It's Always Possible Attitude, and that's what we need so much in the criminal justice system to change the lives of women in this country who get caught up in it. So I'd now like to hand over to Sophie Barton Hawkins, who's been through the system herself and can talk about the things that helped her maybe change her life around and her experiences. Sophie. Thank you. Um, I went to prison in September 2007. I spent three years in prison, was released September 2010. Uh, my whole time, in, I went to three different prisons. Two of them couldn't control me because the system isn't set up for females. It's a very masculine-led, masculine-run environment. And 
As such, my behaviour deteriorated to end up in my last prison, which was in Surrey. And there, they were a lot more holistic in their approach to prisoners. They were a lot, a lot friendlier. You could call the staff by their first name, which might not sound like a huge deal, but when you have to call people Miss and Sir, and you can't find out their first names due to their data protection, it was really difficult to actually build up a relationship with any staff. So the third prison I went to, where you could call people by their first name, it was so much friendlier. Um, the routine wasn't set up for women whatsoever. It was very much based on if they had enough staff to unlock you, you'd be able to come out your cell. If not, you could spend 23 hours locked up. Um, many people in prison are mothers, so they've been taken away from their children. Chances are they were single parents before they went to prison. If not, then their partners were probably in prison, which led to them being single parents. So they've gone into prison and their children have been taken away from them. And then they're thinking, well, what have I got? My kids, I'm not going to get them back. So the impact on being a mother must have been so huge for them. And then the impact, if they did keep their children or they were with a family member, the impact of being locked up for 23 hours a day and you don't have that communication with your family. Your children are expected on a Saturday morning to get a phone call from mummy, but because there's no staff, they're not going to get that phone call. So then that impacts on their children and possibly breeds in their children some form of resentment towards authority, which could then lead to them offending. So the knock-on knock impact of having one parent in prison for the families of those, those um, people is huge. The, way that the third prison that I was in was set up was you could go to work, you could do various jobs, you could work, we had a media house, so you could have, you had your own TV channel, we filmed our own programmes around the prison, we had a birds of prey centre which was very therapy based, so there were birds that were rescue birds and they'd take often the naughtiest offenders and get them to work with the birds because they're able to form some form of relationship with the animals and then the animals obviously start behaving a bit better their behaviour improves. You get educated up to GCSE grade C, um, but a lot of people within the prison environment don't have any education. They can't read, they can't write. There's a scheme called Toe by Toe, which is led by other offenders, which teaches people from all nationalities, so a lot of foreign nationals, as well as English ladies, how to read and write, which is fantastic because that reduces the impact of re-offending because if you can read and write, you've got more chance of writing a CV. You've got more chance of being able to pay your debts on time because you'll understand the letters that are being put to you. And there was other meaningful activities that you could take part in. You could go out and do the gardening, which was great for women because that was more holistic for them to be able to go out and get out in the open air, which you can't do very often. But on the back of that, there was also a lot of bad work. You could go and work for Virgin Airlines, packing... Um, the, the packs that you get on the plane, so the headphones, they put the foam on the headphones, the eye mask, they'd make all that uh, kind of boring work that you'd get put into if they couldn't place you anywhere else. So you're sat doing peace rate, just thinking, 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 and then you're getting locked up in your cell. Because there aren't many female staff within the prisons, and there are mainly male staff, and they're mainly ex-army, ex-military, so they're quite harsh. You've got women that have always suffered abuse at the hands of men, going into prison and suddenly being locked behind a door by a man. Um, they're very emotional, always. Women are always very emotional when they're in prison because it's, it's, it's the lack of knowing and understanding what's going on. So that leads them to self-harm. Self-harm rates in prison are phenomenally high. Attempted suicide rates are huge. The um, health care provision for people with mental health difficulties is generally people that are studying at university still, so they go in and you're kind of like guinea pigs for them. Um, it's often said in prison that a lot of the healthcare staff are NHS rejects and the doctors are always known as Dr. No because you go to them and the answer is always going to be no. So people with these mental health issues just spend their time locked up in their, behind their door. So they're self-harming, getting on their bow, having to ask a man who the reason they probably are self-harming is because they're reliving their memories from their past lives and they're having to try and explain this to a a bloke who represents to them some, you know, figure of like demonic stuff. So it is not really ideal to have that. There is counselling provisions available, but they're few and far between. Again, when the prison can facilitate it, you can have this stuff. So a lot of people turn to writing if they can write. If they can't write, they turn to drawing, painting, artwork. Um, for me, I found that I could write by being in a prison cell. I remember I'd been 
put behind my door. I think I was locked behind my door for 10 days, and out of those 10 days, I got an hour to go and have a shower and get my medication. In all fairness, I had been naughty, so I wasn't just there for the sake of it, and that was my punishment. And in that time, I had no TV, because you do have TV in cells. They act as babysitter, because it's always a distraction. If you've got a TV, it's something to take your mind off being in prison. I had no TV. My um, access to books had been restricted. So I really, all I had in my, my cell that I can remember was two pens and a pad of paper, and I just started writing. I started writing everything that was in my head out on the paper, turned it into poetry, started writing little excerpts for a book. And it was f through writing that I managed to find out like, who I was and figure out all my offending behaviour and where I'd gone wrong. And so in terms of imprisonment, I think if people offered art and writing classes to people a lot more, the offending rate would go down because if you're painting a picture and you can't communicate what's going on inside, you can put it into a painting and it doesn't matter that you can't read and you can't write. It doesn't matter if you can't speak English. You're still able to, to express yourself through painting. And I think, um, as was mentioned earlier, when I worked for the Cursor Trust, that came across so much in people's artwork that you could just feel all the torment and rage going on inside them through their artwork. I think for the English prison system, especially for females to evolve, it needs to be a lot more female focused. There's, I think it's 12,000, is it 12,000 women? In, in Four and a half at any one time, yeah. and about 12,000 a year going yeah, through the in, system. In the UK, female, well, in the prison system, that's a lot of women to be going through in a revolving door. So they go in the first time, kids taken away from them, what they're going to do, go out, re-offend, they've got nothing now. So it should be a lot more based on okay, you shoplifted, why have you shoplifted? To pay, pay debts, okay, we'll help you pay your debts, we'll teach you how to do it properly. That way you're not gonna go to prison. There's people that I've met in prison that go in and out, in and out, in and out on really silly sentences. I got sentenced to a large sentence and I really should have been in prison and you know, I'm quite glad that I went to prison. But then I saw other people going in, getting sentenced to like 30 days. That's such a damaging impact. They've got a criminal record they have to declare then. It's gonna prevent them getting a job and moving forward. So I think in terms of sentencing women, they should look at their whole family life, whether they've got children that rely on them, whether they're a carer to elderly parents or carer to siblings. There's a lot that should be taken into consideration rather than just going on case studies and case law and being, in this case, we gave someone that sentence, so we're gonna to have to give it to you too. I think for the prison system to work for females, it needs to be run by females, advised by females, and run definitely for females because it just isn't at the moment. Thank you very much, Sophie. I think uh, both our speakers so far have, have really set out some issues which I hope that you will come back to in discussion. And I think one of the, the strongest points from Sophie's talking is about the need, well, about the, the detrimental, the sort of futile point of locking people up for 23 hours a day with nothing to do and both our speakers have talked about the need for holistic services, arts, the creative side, outlets for women and in 2007 uh, the, the former government, Labour government, commissioned Baroness Corston to do a review of the treatment of vulnerable women in the criminal justice system out of which came a seminal report, the Corston report um, and that set out a blueprint for the, the treatment of women offenders, people who had come into contact, done something wrong with the criminal justice system that would not involve many of them being sent to prison and instead it would involve setting up a series of holistic one-stop shop services in this country that women could buy to be sent to as a diversion from custody. Women in Prison was very involved with uh, that uh, on the advisory committee for that report and has been uh, tirelessly campaigning since then uh, along with others for keeping the Causton uh, report and the agenda going. So I'm delighted to welcome Rachel Hayford to the floor now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have to wiggle in my chair. My legs are really short and I feel like I'm, I don't, I'm not quite sure how to sit. So please excuse me now that they don't touch the floor. And I now feel like a child, sorry. Um, women in prison. Um, women in prison was set up over 28 years ago by a woman, who, an offender herself, who was spent some time in Holloway and was absolutely horrified by the treatment of the women there. In particular, um, what led her to setting up the organisation was a young woman had set fire to herself and burnt to death in her cell. 
So this was 28 years ago, and at that time there were just over a thousand women in prison across the UK, across England. Um, today, we have 13 prisons across England, and there are over 4,000 women in prison. Um, horrific, ridiculous, massive growth over um, the last uh, 20 odd years. Um, we were originally set up as a campaigning organisation um, and very quickly became a service provider as well. So what we do, we, we provide services to address the needs um, of women affected by the criminal justice system. We also educate the, educate the public and try and influence policy. As we said before, we um, fed into, and our previous director worked very closely with Baroness Corston on the Corston report. Um, I, what I thought was, having listened to everybody else, was to give you some really core, an overview, the basic statistics of women in prison today. Um, and this is women in prison today in this country, but I have to say, I think the, the statistics bear relevance to women internationally. You know, women in international, the female population internationally is the fastest growing population of offenders. Um, a statistic was given to me, I have to say it was given to me, I can't tell you where it came, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was 100%. Um, I'm just going to read these statistics out, um, <clears throat> and these are the women that we come across every day. So 80% of the women that come into, that are in prison have mental health issues. 60% have got substance misuse, 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 I can't speak, mis, misuse issues. 60% have experienced domestic violence. Now that's the stat, the stats that are brought out every year. Our experience as an organisation is that the women that access our services, 80 to 90% of them have experienced domestic violence or sexual abuse, which is a staggering figure. 30% um, come from the care system. 60% of children, as Sophia said, um, they, they leave behind children under the age of 18. 17,700 children a year are separated from their mothers. And that's just the mothers who choose to disclose when they're going to prison. Because often a woman won't choose to disclose in fear that she may lose her child. Um, and it is what something Sophie said about the intergenerational offending. There are figures now, there are statistics to prove that 60% of the children whose parents, you know, a male or female, go to prison will become offenders themselves. And that is absolutely horrifying, particularly when we put it in the context that 60%, I keep saying 60%, but actually a new figure is 80% of women who are in prison pose absolutely no risk to the public. You know, and I, what, what for us is key as an organisation is that, you know, what we believe is no woman should be in prison today as it exists today. So what, we're not saying that there should be no prisons. What we are saying is as it exists today. Our prison system that we have today was built for men by men. And it does not work for women, exactly as Sophie has said. Um, Predominantly, if we took that 60 or 80 percent, but that 60 percent, we would reduce our prison population down to a thousand. You know, and then we could have small custodial units, which is something that came out of the Corson report, the ineffectiveness of the prisons that, there, that we have today. Small custodial units, which could be closer to women's homes, because with only 13 prisons across the country, most women are miles away from their family, miles away from anybody they know. Families can't get to see them, um, which disenfranchises them even more than they already are. Um, what else should I say? 27% of the women that we women in prison are being, come from BME communities. Our experiences is higher than that. 47 to 50% of the women we work with are from BME communities. Um, I just want to read you this this stat though. This is oh, sorry, stats get exhausting. But if I can just read you this one stat. Um, this is how effective prison really isn't. So 51% of women leaving prison are reconvicted with one year. For those serving less than 12 months, this increases to 62%. So, you know, there's obviously a hint here, prison's not working. For those having served 10 sentences, you might think that 10 sentences serve is a lot, but actually it's not. We, we work with a lot of women on what we call the revolving door and they re-offend, re-offend. 88% um, of them Reoffend after that kind of pivotal ten sentences. Prison doesn't work. You know, it absolutely, completely doesn't work. What we advocate for is that those 60% or 80%, which is the re most recent figure, who pose no risk to the community, to the communities, should not be in prison. 
You know, so whilst we are looking at and we're talking about the state of prisons and how they can't look after women and there aren't the services there, the emphasis needs to be taken away from the prisons. You know, because what we do is we lay the responsibility at the door of the NHS, probation, prison service. This isn't, you know, the actual the responsibility needs to lie with the judiciary and the government. You know, if we cannot change the system, we cannot have an impact on... These women should not be going to prison. And if we as society don't open our eyes and start looking at the issues that they have, then it's never going to change. It's very easy to kind of be blinkered by the headlines that come in the papers and everyone, oh, you know, that they should be in prison. Bottom line is, most of them shouldn't be. You know, they could serve sentences in the community. And let me tell you, community sentences aren't easy. But what can happen in the community is they can be provided by support, the, um, support to address their core issues. I just want to read, if I can, just very quickly, because, I mean, I wasn't actually sure if I was going to be here because we've got all the emails messed up. But for me, this is an, a fantastic opportunity to um, just to mention our, our, you know, our founder, Chris Tchaikovsky, because she's no longer with us, an incredible woman. Um, but something she said 20 years ago, we are taking the most hurt people out of society to punish them in order to teach them how to live within society. It is at best futile. Whatever else a prisoner knows, she knows everything there is to know about punishment because that is exactly where she has grown up with. Whether it's childhood sexual abuse, indifference, neglect, punishment is most familiar to her. So really, really, do we still want to be saying this in 20 years' time? I think the introduction was, oh, 100 years' time, we'll be looking back. Do you know what? I'm a bit scared. I don't think we will be looking back in 100 years and saying this is what we used to do. Because if we keep carrying on as we are, we'll be saying, why are we still having the same discussions? Thank you very much, Rachel. In, in the knowledge that there are quite a lot of men in this room, <laughs> I just want to point out that a number of the issues that, that we've been talking about that impact and affect women in prison are clearly there for men in prison as well. A lot of men in prison have also led very damaged lives, but the, it's the proportionality, the, the percentage of women, nearly all of them have, and the impact, the punishment impact of imprisonment on women is disproportionately greater, in part due to things like the loss of their child. So it's not that we're saying that women necessarily have to be treated, that they're different to men in all aspects, but the responses to their offending need and must be women-centered. As, as has been said by, by all our speakers, really, that the, the systems that are in place all over the world, I mean, I'm involved with the European network and international work, we've heard from Dr. Betty, all over the world, women are such a tiny percentage of the prison population that the, 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 the solutions are all just taken from what they do with men. And that can't be right, it doesn't work. Women are criminalized differently. They're treated as, as doubly offending because they've offended against the norm of the perfect woman. The, I'm sure most people here will remember the, the Jeffrey Archer case where the, the judge in the original, per, the original 1987 trial describes his delightful wife as fragrant and he used all these words that made her the most perfect wife and he actually said, you know, no man that's married to this perfect wife would have gone with a prostitute against whom we have this demonized prostitute and of course he wasn't convicted then until, until much later. So we have this sort of double criminalization of women. We have many women in the criminal justice system from overseas who are drugs mules. They're escaping poverty, trying to find a way out of poverty. What happens? They end up in the criminal justice system, imprisoned for lengthy, lengthy 12, 15, 20 year sentences. So it's about finding different solutions. So I'm now going to open the discussion up to the floor. If you can try and keep your points relatively short um, so that we have opportunities for the speakers to, to respond to them. And I'll do my best to, um, to spot people. So um, do we have anybody who'd like to open up the uh, comments from the floor, please? Yes, here, thank you. If you could just wait, we've got a roaming mic, and then there's somebody at the back by the concrete pillar I can see. Um, hi, um, we, you've talked quite a lot about um, re-offending, but what about um, the initial offence? Is, is there a fundamental difference between the way that men and, and women offend for the first time, um, and is that affected by something fundamentally different? And you've touched upon some of the issues, I'm aware, but 
sort of how that how that first offence is different in men and women. Okay, I don't know whether Rachel wants to respond. I mean, I have a bit of knowledge of that, but Rachel, would you like to respond well, to I that? Suppose, I suppose in my, in my experience, I mean, the w women generally, a majority of women whose offences are around shoplifting, um, that kind of offence, which is, no, as I said, no risk to the public. Um, but, I mean, the, the, issue, the issue is, is why are they doing it? So, for example, for a man, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm actually... I'm citing um, evidence here, but for a woman, because of their issues, mental health, domestic violence, etc., quite often theirs will be to survive. You know, they are damaged to begin with. For a man, that may not be the case. You know, so the difference is on the offence is that the woman is already marginalised, disadvantaged, um, she's coming from a particularly difficult background. With men, that isn't quite often the way, and particularly in younger men, I think, where it's more just part and parcel violence. of growing. It tends to be less violence yeah. with women in the, in yeah. the early offending. It's much more about, as Rachel said, about what's known in the jargon as acquisitive crime, theft-related um, uh, uh, crime, often just to fund, you know, to get basics for themselves, for their children, or indeed, obviously, to fund um, drug use, drugs yeah. misuse, which is the similar to men. But there, there is much less of the early entry through violence. It's less antisocial. You find with young men, it tends to be antisocial behaviour that gets them Started. You will get girls getting involved with that, of course. Not saying that there aren't any young girls that aren't involved with antisocial behaviour, but I think if one was to look at the statistics, it would, that would be the main difference. I don't know if anybody else I don't know, in India, you have anything you'd like to add from the Indian perspective on that? Uh, if I would combine my police and prison experience, I think men reoffend by design. Women reoffend or offend by accident sometimes. It's not generic, but I've, what I'm, it's a trend which I've observed. Men plan their crime sometimes, and they have absolute reasons for that. It could be economic, it could be revenge, it could be, uh, so it could be planned and revenge, and it could be economic. But uh, women re sometimes, re uh, sometimes offend at the spur, or it's an emotional crime. Mm. Uh, so I would think, and therefore they, Consequences happen, while men consciously sometimes go into crime knowing the consequences. But they want to take the consequences in the stride because they want to commit a crime. It's like a want to commit a crime. For man, it's a wanting to commit a crime. For a woman, it's a crime which happens. Yeah, and sometimes happens through desperation yeah. and all kinds of things. Okay, uh, there's a question at the back by the pillar there, and then I've got one here I just saw. Um, I wanted to ask Dr. Betty a question. Um, I think what you've done sounds incredible. Um, and I had two questions, really. Um, firstly, did you encounter any resistance to the, the model that you tried to put in within the prison in, in India for the women? And also, has any other prisons within India taken up your approach um, to how they deal with women prisoners? The resistance was natural when I started to reform from a, a holding institution to a reform institution. But it took me time, but it didn't take me too long because I didn't have too much time in hand knowing in India you don't get long postings. And when you start doing good, it's you start earning the envy of so many men that they want you out as soon as possible. So I was in a hurry, a woman in hurry, saying, let me see whatever I can do in the shortest possible time. That's why I didn't get more than two years. For me, prison, at that time when I got a prison assignment, it was considered a punishment assignment. I was tough as a woman who would not take nonsense, who would go by the rule book, and who wouldn't care whether it's a VIP or a non-VIP. So that was the kind of, so I was given a prison posting almost as a, as a punishment assignment. And therefore I was in a hurry to do. But change happened faster for the reason that the prison staff never had been led and shown another way of working. For the first time they saw another way of working and it was rewarding for them and it was a win-win for them. So I made them look at the winning aspect of reform rather than the losing aspect of reform. And when they, what was the winning aspect? Is the reward, the reputation, the respect, and even the peace within society, within the prison. Because as a corrupt prison manager, 
he or she faces huge amount of violence inside the prison. But as a reformer, you, that violence reduces inside the prison. So therefore, when, I saw, when they saw this happening, it, appreciation and acceptance and respect coming back, and peace descending because of reform, they became my participants. Secondly, it spread. Then this movement became national. This became very visible, particularly when I got the Max Sisse Award, which I mentioned. It became international news, and certainly national. And now the question was, why can't this be replicated in other prisons in India? And then the courts took up on public interest litigation. And then the policies came, and then now these are national policies for women prisoners to be, to be con all prisons to be conducting these programs, which I mentioned. These are policies. But in the end, I've always said policies are practiced by men and women. What kind of people leadership you have, what kind of managers we have. You may have a document, you may have a policy, but if you don't have compassion in your heart, and if you're basically not service oriented, and you don't like what you do, and you basically hate, and you feel like that they deserve to be punished, you will still punish them, even though you may technically be within the policy. Thank you very much. And if we've got a question here, and then I can see three hands there and a couple over there. All right. Hello, I think I've got two questions as well. Um, can we put these reforms into place um, without it costing a lot of money? Yes. Because it would be great to think we could do something without wanting a lot of money, which is not available at the moment. And would there not be an outcry if we did so much for women and nothing similar for men? I mean, wouldn't they think that that's just a soft option? Would it be fair to the men, in fact? But, um, yeah, so I think I agree with the reforms, but I don't think women should be treated as though, you know, they never offend, they never do anything bad, because they do do bad things. It's not just shoplifting, they do other things as well. And they shouldn't do them. That hurts somebody, you know. Um, so I think it, it shouldn't be so soft, but I think reforms are very, very good for all prisoners. Shall I? Yeah. yeah. Um, on, the on the cost, the costing, it costs, um, the, the figures vary, but we're talking about, and on average, about £54,000 a year to keep a woman in prison. Um, for her to serve a sentence in the community, you're talking fourteen, maybe 15000 So absolutely, if women stopped being sent to prison, it would be far cheaper. So there are the resources, because abs absolutely at the moment, I mean, with, with the cuts that are happening, across the board, you know, which we are all seeing in our jobs, but, you know, within the prison service probation, the services and the resources they have are, com are limited. You know, the, the numbers of officers are being cut out of prison. So, in fact, in theory, inside prison could become worse because their resources are cut so. Um, as far as men and women, I, I think what, what it's about is, it's about what we want is equal outcomes. So I agree with you 100%. There are some women that need to be in prison, definitely. But what we're saying is that there's a majority that don't because they pose no risk to the public. And we're not saying that that isn't the case with men. I don't know. I don't. This is about women. I work with an organisation that works with women. If that was the case and there are, were people out there campaigning and active, you know, activists around this, you know, then there would be that same push. Um, what it's about is equal outcomes. And for equal outcomes for men and women, you need to treat women dif differently because we're not getting, we will not get, and we haven't got the same outcomes by treating them the same. Women have different needs. So I guess going back is absolutely, it's not about you know, saying no one should be in prison because there are some people that need to go to prison. Absolutely. Um, men and women, you know, men, there must be men have the same needs That's to an extent. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. to an extent. I guess. Right here and now, we're not saying that, but our focus is on women. Yeah. So that's why we're here. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, there are people campaigning quite rightly for the re overall reduction in the prison population. Prison is society's most expensive failure. Yeah. It costs a fortune. You've just heard, for women, it costs £54,000 a year. For young offenders, it's similar. For the adult male percent population, it's a little bit less. That's just the cost of keeping them in prison. When you look at the reconviction rates, the fact that it fails 
yeah. miserably. The on costs of imprisoning not just women but men as well is colossal to society in terms of the childcare, in terms of the failures, in terms of the, the re-offending. And all we're looking at as a society, we're particularly bad, I think, in this country, especially at looking short term. We're looking at money, saving money here and now, not saving money for 10 years down the line and improving the lives of all of us and all of our children 10, 20, 30 years down the line. So we, we have to look at costs, we have to look at uh, all those things, but we have to look at it not just the actual cost of imprisonment. And just briefly on the men, as, as I said before, I think you're absolutely right. A huge numbers of men should not be in prison. I was actually discussing this very recently. Now that I'm on the parole board and I'm making decisions about release of men and women who are serving very serious sentences, and I see the damaged lives of most of the young men who are doing very serious sentences, they're similar. But I think the point is we can start with the women's population. It's small, it's manageable. If we can prove results and we can get some change for women, then perhaps we can begin to make the arguments for making similar changes for men. But we need to prove it with that, with perhaps with the women's population first. So uh, I know there yeah. were at least three questions over okay. here. So. Um, I was um, thrilled to listen to Dr. Betty's lecture on Friday and I really loved her innovative uh, non-economic budget budget and how she brought outsiders, volunteers and NGOs into the organisation but without it costing the prison any money. Is this pie in the sky for the UK? What are the barriers to this happening? People like us with skills and, and maybe time to give. Can we go into prisons in the UK? Is it too bureaucratic? Um, there are lots and lots of issues with this. Uh, NGOs are not free. NGO work does not come free. Uh, maybe it comes free in India, although I don't think it does. I was asking Dr. Betty before. She had to fundraise for those organisations to come in. And we have to dispel the myth that, that volunteers and or voluntary sector organisations provide free services. There is a vast amount of work that's done in prisons uh, and uh, in the community with offenders through not-for-profit charitable sector organisations. Uh, Sophie may, may well have benefited from some, and maybe perhaps she can talk about that. Obviously, the Kersler Trust that we were talking about. Yeah, for I you out there. Right. And people like me, people with, with time is still the, yeah, it is difficult. We do put up a lot of barriers to volunteers going in. There's huge, can take you six months to get security cleared. You have to go in through some kind of organization. Things like prison chaplaincies have a lot of volunteers going in, uh, befriending prisoners who have nobody else to befriend. Um, uh, Sophie mentioned the Toe by Toe project, which is a fantastic project, mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic, low cost project, teaching, using prisoners to teach other prisoners to read. But what it does is it uses people like yourselves to go and teach the prisoners to use the, the books. And they're, they're always looking for volunteers. There are a lot of voluntary sector organizations who are looking for volunteers. And I would urge all of you to, to consider that, mentoring through the gate work, all kinds of different areas. There are, but it's, it can be frustrating. It can take you a very long time. And you do have to go in through an official organization. You can't just go in as somebody who wants to go in. Uh, I know the lady in front of you. Oh, see, sorry, we had a question there. Um, I just wondered if any work was being done with the government and with employers. I, until I retired, worked in the voluntary sector and we had terrible, terrible problems. We wanted to employ women who had a criminal record. We really wanted to. And we often interviewed amazing women who would do amazing work but had a simple, you know, quite an, an unworrying criminal record. But our contracts wouldn't allow us. The contractors would, that there were local authorities or the government would, would say, no, you must not. Your work, I did work with vulnerable adults, but I considered some of the workforce to be vulnerable too. But is there any work being done on those things? Because they're so prohibitive. Yeah. In, in a nutshell, yes, there is work being done. <laughs> uh, there are changes about to come into effect to the disclosure. The, um, they're finally, finally, after years of campaigning by organizations like NACRO, Prim Prison Reform Trust, Unlock, uh, I'm sure Women in Prison as well, there are changes being made. It's slow, and, it, and I think you've highlighted a really, really serious problem. Um, but again, to those of you in the room, I'm sure some of you are employers, you know, don't always look at a criminal record and think, I can't employ this person. Yeah. You can, and there are some fantastically talented uh, and committed people who, who uh, can be a real asset to your organization. And, uh, you know, you have several in this room today, I'm sure. So uh, we've got well, at least one more question over here, and then I know there are questions on this side. I'm not ignoring that side. So 
There was one other person that had their hand up here, yeah. Uh, Sophie mentioned that um, there are far more men than women working. Uh, Sophie mentioned that there are far more men than women working um, in prisons, um, but is there a gender imbalance in the rest of the um, criminal justice system, like in police, um, lawyers, judges, and so on? And what effect does that have? I've noticed with my quite extensive experience of the criminal justice system, magistrates tend to be women, uh, Crown Court judges tend to be blokes, um, police staff, well, they're quite mixed in terms of the people in the custody suites. Probation officers tend to be female. Um, I've, been very, I've gone through three probation officers in 18 months, and they've all been female, which is quite good. Um, but in youth offending work, it tends to be males rather than females. So I think it is equally balanced, but it depends which field you go into. And as an overall, in each different sector, it's going to be more one way or the other. It won't be exactly equal, but as a whole system, it probably would be equally balanced, I should imagine. I think it tends to follow gender stereotypes. So in the sort of authoritative roles, you tend to get more men. In the high paid roles within the legal system, you tend to get more men, which is why the magistrates tend to be women, because it's unpaid. Um, parole board that I'm on now, I was pleasantly surprised actually by the number of women are, that are involved, um, particularly sort of professional women. Uh, voluntary sector is primarily female dominated, um, but I, I do think there is an imbalance, definitely, uh, as you say, particularly police and uh, in the in the prisons within prison staff. Yeah. So we've got uh, hi. There. Yeah. Um, I have a question about a question about short sentences. Um, I thank you for enlightening me. I had no idea of the impact that a short sentence has on a woman and her family. But um, I've been kind of uh, under the assumption that those short sentences happen after, like, after going through community service and after going through lots of like steps. Is that assumption wrong to start with? And then secondly, if prison sentences are being used as a last resort after all of those things, then what can be used as a last resort instead? Um, I, I would say your assumption is wrong, that it isn't that necessarily that there are community sentences, etc., offered first. There are a lot of women who are breached, you know, and when we look at the increase in the number of women going to prison, it's about harsher sentencing, the more severity in the sentencing, and breaches of sentences. Um, sorry, what was the second bit? Um, what could be the last, last resort, resort? Okay. I mean, somebody, somebody asked me this the other day. Um, I think the thing is, if you're not going to, if you put in place, because we don't do this, you know, and we're trying to do this with the women's community centres, you put in place a, a whole package of support, so they're serving their community sentence, but you are addressing every other area at the same time, you're offering them the opportunity for counselling, um, education and employment, so you're addressing all of that. If you had that package, hopefully there would never be, a, that wouldn't, you wouldn't need the prison as a last resort, because you have addressed the core issue. The whole thing is that the core issue is not being addressed. You know, I think that it's really clear when you work, you know, going into the prisons that the majority of the women do not know that they have a choice. They don't, they have grown up in the, uh, how they have grown up, what they've grown up with, they don't know that life can be different. So if you put that support in and, and offer these choices, you empower them um, to reach their potential, hopefully you would never have to go to that, the final thing, which is go to, you know, send them to custody. I mean, you, there are people who will end up at the end of that line in, in custody, obviously, as you say, because the courts feel they have no option. But I think a lot of it goes back to what we we're saying about costs and short term. Is if we actually invested in, in not just the holistic services for women, but if we have invested properly in drug treatment services yeah. and mental health services in the community, we wouldn't be getting the numbers coming into the system of both men and women that we're getting. Now, I know we've got a question at the front. Can I just, we're, we're running short on time. Can I just have a show of hands of remaining questions? I know there's a few, so we've got one, two, three over there, and one, oh, okay, we'll finish with the man over that side. <laughs> so we'll take the three questions on this side, and then we'll speedily go over across here. Okay, so we start with the lady here at the front. Um, oh, sorry. I've got okay. the mic, is You've that okay? You've got the mic, okay. <laughs> yeah, then it goes over to this lady <laughs> afterwards, thank um, you. <laughs> okay, um, we've heard sort of quite a lot about the impact that there is on uh, a family when um, a woman goes to prison. I actually had a question that related to pregnant prisoners and how pregnant prisoners are treated. Uh, I remember there being some lurid stories about 10 or 15 years ago about 
uh, female prisoners who were giving birth, being shackled to the bed, things like that, um, and whether they're allowed any time to actually bond with the child after this happens, whether um, any children remain uh, with uh, their mothers or whether they are taken straight away into care or whether that's looked on an individual basis, and also um, how that how it works sort of in the UK, but also in India, whether there's any difference there. Do you want to start with that one, Rachel? I'll give you... In the, in, the, in the UK, so if a woman arrives in prison and she's pregnant, um, there are, I think you'll find there's six um, mother and baby units within prisons. Okay, now to, for a woman to get onto a mother and baby unit, she has to apply and she has to sit aboard. And then if, if it's approved, um, she will leave the prison to have the baby. She'll go to a local hospital, hospital. She's not shackled, but she is accompanied by two officers. So there are, I mean, I went and visit some, visited someone after she'd had her baby. These two officers were with her the whole time. So it's very obvious on a general ward that here is somebody from prison with the two officers stood beside her. For her, she didn't get to keep her child. And she actually, for the time she was in hospital, which in her case was 48 hours, she got the opportunity to say goodbye. What generally happens from there is the baby was taken into temporary foster care, but the baby was taken to visit her every day. Now that depends on accessibility into the prison, and then you're going back to what Sophie was saying about lockdown and resources. But in, ideally, she would get to see her child on a daily basis. <coughs> With the other women, with their children, um, there are two, two, with the mother and baby units, some of them are for 18 months, some of them for nine months. Um, so it just, and then what, um, more, what's, what happens after the 18 months is arrangements have to be made outside for the child to either go into family care or social services care. And, and in Europe, there are lots of models as well, similar, where, where um, women can keep their children up to usually about four. In Scotland, yeah. actually, at Cornton Vale, you can keep your, your child, again, all subject to risk assessment and everything else, up to, up to four. In India? As well. You, the pregnancy would probably be a ground for a bail, but once may not be, so it depends on the court. But once she's in, she gets all the medical facilities, and she wants to keep the child, she cannot be deprived of that. So she's allowed. And then the, the hospital facilities and play with school facilities or nursery facilities then would be available for her inside the prison. Italy actually has some really progressive laws about mothers. Um, and there, is, there was a law as a result of campaigning that says that any woman who is sentenced to imprisonment, who needs a, but who has a child under 10, that that sentence should be deferred and they should be under house arrest. Now, it's not always implemented, like with all these things, there are caveats. But they probably have, that, as far as I've come across, they have the most progressive laws in favor of, of mothers who, um, in the criminal justice system. Um, now, there's a question here. Hi, yeah, um, I did a very brief question really, but are there any statistics on how the judiciary treats male and female offenders who commit the same crime? I know there have been a lot of instances in the past where um, a male offender will get community service or a suspended sentence, whereas a female offender will get a custodial sentence. Just, just recently, um, up, up, until, uh, up until very recently, I could sit here and say women were treated far more severe than men. Um, I met with somebody quite high up in NOMS just recently, not sorry, National Offender Managers just recently, and the new statistics say that, in fact, it's young men who are treated more harshly. Mm. So, in fact, no. Women and the judiciary themselves yeah. always vehemently deny yeah. that there's any discretion. I mean, you will never get, you'll never find a magistrate or a judge who says, face to your face, or at least I haven't yet, you know, oh, yes, I treat women differently. But the statistics bear that out. But they also bear out, particularly with the magistracy, huge variances in benches. So it, yeah. it may, you know, in terms of how they treat men and women. So it's not as simple as just looking at like-for-like -like offences. You know, you've actually got to sort of narrow it down to looking at that particular magistrate's court and how they sentence, because there are vast, vast differences. So we have one more question over here. Hello. Um, £54,000 per um, inmate is an awful lot of money, and I was just interested, um, if you're locked up for 23 hours a day, where that money is going <laughs> is the first question. Um, and then also, because as a teacher, you can see families in crisis from when children are very young, I'm just interested in if there's any programmes that work with families on a long-term basis and are more successful than always sort of dealing with the after-effects. Sophia, I don't know if you want to come in here. Um, I don't know where the money goes, in all fairness. I know that one, if you're a basic grade prison officer who just start and you get quite a good pay packet, probably about 21 grand for a start off. So obviously a lot of money goes into that. There's a lot of security in the prison. They pay a lot of money for barbed wire. 
on the on top of fences, which is, I think, a breach of the European human rights, and so the prisons do pay fines for having that, so that could be where money goes. Um, <laughs> it doesn't... All the education and stuff is funded privately. The prison I was in was Nescott College, which is North East Surrey College, and then it went to Manchester College, so that was all funded privately. I think, I think it still comes from the prison budget, actually, though, so oh, I think, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I actually, honestly, I couldn't tell you where £54,000 to keep me in prison it, 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 I goes. think it also covers the medical costs, and because we were hearing about the, um, the high um, mental health and other needs of women, the, the, the actual costs, of those kind of healthcare costs of women in prison is significantly higher than for men. And I think also they have a, they tend to be smaller prisons, the women's prisons, so you have a higher cost per prisoner staff yeah. ratio. Um, but, you know, at the same time, across the board, the number of actual positive programs going on in prison is reducing vastly, drastically, um, because the prison service, like everybody, has been set you know, with huge funding cuts. And so it's a real worry that people are going to be locked up for longer with even less to do than they're already doing, as, as Sophie so graphically um, mentioned before. But um, yeah, I think we all wonder why it costs quite so much, quite frankly. Right, I think we come over here now. Yeah, th thanks for letting me speak. Um, <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> Just want to say uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Bedi. We we grew up watching those reforms back in, back in India and and how powerful they've been. Mm -hmm. um, and it's wonderful to hear their post prison support as well. So so you, you run a school with 200 kids in there. Uh, so question for Sophie: I mean, how strong a post prison framework mm -hmm. is in UK um, and could be improved in in future? Post prison framework over here. Um I don't really know. I mean, I see probation once a month, and that's pretty much all my post-prison framework is. I have to declare on every single job application that I ever fill in until I retire that I've been to prison, which I think is horrendous. It's going to hold me back. I mean, I'm very lucky that I have a job, um, but a lot of the people that I've known in prison that have got out don't have work because of their criminal record. And the, the post-prison framework is there's no support when you come out. I mean, I get my support from women in prison. I work very closely with one of their workers, who is absolutely fantastic, and she's really helped me. But not everyone has that, because not everyone knows where to look. You're not signposted to these places. It's, you, you come across them, and once you found them, then you're lucky. But probation don't tell you what is available to you, what you are entitled to, because, frankly, they're not entirely certain themselves. So post-prison framework is a very weak thing over here at the moment. It, it, absolutely. I mean, I would just echo that and say anybody's, any prisoner serving a short sentence mm. comes out with absolutely nothing, mm. literally nothing, no support, mm. you know, and it's no wonder some of them literally get out the prison gate and almost go straight back in again. If you're serving more than a year, you will come out on a license, so the support that kicks in is actually primarily, um, it's about super monitoring and supervision, it's not support. So uh, it's really about making sure that you don't do anything that's going to pick you up and get you recalled. So you might, you might have an appointment with probation officer. The longer sentences get a little bit more because, again, it might actually be part of their license condition. But it tends to be done from that punitive element. And it comes back again to not wanting to invest in the things that are going to mean that people are going to be able to get their lives back on track, are going to be able to move forward and not come back in and cost us all a whole lot of money. And, um, again, so much of it depends on the voluntary sector, a lot of the resettlement services that are there, that if you're lucky that you find out about them, as Sophie has said, you know, it's by chance and they're run by the voluntary sector. We were hoping to have, we were expecting to have on the panel, I'll just briefly mention uh, Lucy Perman from Clean Break Theatre Company, who do wonderful work with, with women um, who've come out of prison or women who are uh, involved with the criminal justice system for one way or another through theatre in London. She's sadly not well today, which is why she's not here, but it's, it's organised organizations like hers and, and many, many others, but you have to know that they exist and unfortunately many people don't. So I think that that but brings... Can I add a yes, word? yes. I think the key to the reform program which I could succeed in Delhi was how do I value time of prisoners and what, how do I create resources for them? If, I, if my government cannot afford, how do I generate it from the community and how soon do I get them integrated? It's a communitization of reforms. I think the key is, do you as prison administrators value prisoners' time? And do you make that into an asset, or do you make it into a double liability? Because if you use it as an asset, then you check the revolving door. 
But if you leave it as a liability, you're actually increasing contamination and you're increasing the possibilities of reoffending. That's what I did. Prior to me, they never looked at it, looked at time as an asset. Moment I started to look within the same rules, within the same system, same system which would allow a community worker to come in after six months or even not allow, I gave it within weeks of that person coming for music therapy and it costed me nothing. It costed those persons also nothing because they were volunteers. They had the skills and they wanted to do something for the community. I only facilitated them to express their volunteerism. It costed them nothing because it was their time which they wanted to donate to the prison. I think it sometimes these reforms need not cost in economic terms. They will only cost you personal time or people's time. You just have to integrate the two, but the key would be the mission statement is do you value prisoners' time of which you as prison administrators are custodians of? And I looked at myself as a custodian of prisoners' time. That's how it changed. So I think, uh, I think you've heard a lot today about how um, really in essence it's, a, it's about if you have the will you can, you can impact, you can affect change. You know, not everything costs money as Dr. Betty's just said and that's not just in India, there's a lot that can happen here. It's about changing the mindset, it's about changing the mindset of prison staff, it's about changing the mindset of government and politicians, it's about changing the mindset of the, the people in the system, the women in the system, enabling people to feel enabling them to feel that they're worth something, that they have a voice, that they can count, that they can be somebody. As Sophie said, she found her voice through, through her arts. And you have to find a way of enabling damaged women to become whole again. And there are so many better ways of doing that than through imprisonment. So I'd like to thank all of our panel enormously. I'd like to thank you for your contributions and for coming here today. And uh, I wish you an enjoyable rest of WOW Festival. Thank you. Thank you.